morning, everybody. This is the Mac Road Church of Christ Sunday Minor Prophet Study. We're in Jonah chapter 2 and verse 1, but let's have a prayer first. Dear Father in heaven, we're, we're so thankful to be here this morning to come and hear Mike preach the, or teach the lesson to us. We ask that you be with us as hearers, that we would take that message in and, and learn from it. We're, we're so thankful for your son, Jesus Christ, who came to earth to die for our sins. We thankful for the rain. We ask, Lord, that you'd be with those that are not feeling well, that you would be with them and comfort them and bring them back to a better health. We're, we're thankful for so many things, Lord. We ask that you'd be with us now and throughout this day. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, so like I said, we're in Jonah chapter 2. We're, we're looking at the minor prophets, and as we're looking at the minor prophets, we're first covering Jonah here. Remember that Jonah was preaching during the time of the Assyrian captivity, when they were going to go, when Israel, the the, the ten northern tribes, were going to be going off into uh, Assyrian cap captivity, and so he's preaching before that happens, and he's preaching to the city of Nineveh, and remember Nineveh was the capital of Assyria, so he's actually preaching to the to the capital of the people that are gonna going to in a number of years come and destroy Israel, and so he's kind of reluctant about going. So, uh, uh, what happened in the first chapter? All right, he ran off. Did he take a train? Plane? He took a ship, and he was going the opposite way. And what happened when he was in the ship? <laughs> he joined the Navy. There you go. Well, what, what happened in the other ship, in the ship? Okay. Okay. Okay, so the ship was in a storm. The men couldn't figure out why. They figured out that Jonah was, was a prophet running away from God, and the only way the storm was going to stop, because Jonah told them, was to throw him overboard. So they did, and when he did, a submarine came by. No? A great fish came by. All right, whether it was a whale or whether it was a, a, a special fish that God made, either way, uh, he was swallowed by that, that fish. In chapter 2, then, is what we have as his prayer. And it's actually a set up as a poem. Uh, it's, it's a poem, but it, nonetheless, it's uh, uh, what Jonah has written uh, about uh, his experience in there. Uh, it, it's, it's interesting that some people kind of make fun of this and say, you know, J Jonah was in, the, was in the belly of the whale and he writes a poem. Well, he didn't write the poem in the belly of the whale. He wrote the poem after he got out. And after all these things happen, uh, and we attribute the book of Jonah to Jonah, and so therefore he wrote this afterwards. And by the way, uh, have you ever heard of what it takes to write a good song or a good poem? What does it take? It takes what? Okay, uh, lyrics. It takes an emotional experience that happened to you. Most of, most of the really good songs, somebody had an emotional experience, and therefore they had to either write a song or they had to write a poem about it because it was very emotional to them. And so they, they therefore uh, 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 were able to, to write either a song or poetry. Most of the, most of the good poets that, that you can think of, they, they're kind of emotional people, and they say motion in, in a lot of different things which makes it easy for them to write poems, those people that do it quite often. Uh, but anyway, so I'm, I'm just pointing that out because uh, it was quite natural for Jonah to, after this experience, to write a poem about it. And so uh, chapter two is actually a poem. It's not very long, it has seven verses, but there's a number of things in it that we wanna look at and, and consider and think about as we do. And that is that in, in verse two, chapter two and verse one, it says, then Jonah prayed to the Lord, his God, from the stomach of the fish. Now remember, he's writing this after it's all done. And he said, I called out of my distress to the Lord. He answered me. I cried for help from the depth of Sheol. Uh, you heard my voice. <clears throat> uh, for, you, uh, for you had cast me into the deep, into the heart of the sea, and the current engulfed me. All, uh, all your breakers and billows passed over me. So I said, I have been expelled from your sight. Nevertheless, I will look again towards uh, your holy temple. Water encompassed me to the point of death. The, the uh, great deep engulfed me. Weeds were wrapped uh, around my head. 
I descended into the roots of the mountains. The earth with its bars was around me forever, but you have brought me up, uh, but you have brought up my life from the pit, O Lord my God. While I was fainting away, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came to you, into your, into your holy temple. Those who regard vain idols forsake their faithfulness, but I will sacrifice to you with the voice of thanksgiving. That which I have vowed, I will pay. Salvation is from the Lord. Then the Lord commanded the fish, and it vomited Jonah up uh, onto the dry land. And so that little part, of course, was, the, was what God did as a result of this. But Jonah's talking about what happens in his experience while he was in the belly of the whale, or the belly of the fish. And it says Jonah prayed to the Lord. And what, what we need to remember is that uh, uh, um, Many times people come to the Lord or, or, or we cry to the Lord when we're in trouble. Uh, in Psalms 50 and verse 15, uh, the psalmist writes, Call upon me in the day of trouble. I shall rescue you and you will honor me. So uh, the fact is that, that when we go through trouble, it should get us to do a number of things. But one of the things it should get us to do is pray to God. And remember that he's the one that's going to rescue us. What's interesting, of course, here is that Jonah was fleeing from God. But when Jonah got thrown in the belly of the whale and decided he wanted to live, he didn't want to die, uh, that uh, he prayed to God because he understood that God was the only one who could take care of him and could provide for him. Uh, in, in, Psalm, uh, in uh, James chapter 5, as uh, the writer in James 5 is talking about circumstances of life, he says in verse 13, Is anyone among you suffering? then he must pray. So if, you, if you're having trouble or difficulty, God says what we need to do to pray, even if that suffering or difficulty comes from the hand of God, because who else is there that's going to be able to take care of you or to relieve you from that affliction or from that, uh, from that trouble? In Psalms 130 in verse 1 and 2, it says, Out of the depths I have cried to you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplication." And so what we need to remember is that uh, uh, Jonah is in, is in the belly of the whale. He realizes that he's probably going to die, and so he prays to God. And uh, there's a couple of things in here that, that aren't said, but uh, they're implied. And one of those is that Jonah repents. He, he, he changes his mind. He, uh, he's going he's to do what God says, uh, but he turns to God. Now, verse 2 says, And he said, I have called out of my distress to the Lord, and he answered me. I cried for help from the depths of Sheol, and you heard my voice. So one of the things that uh, Jonah was able to accomplish is that when he prayed to God, God heard him. And, and God is looking for us to come to him. It's like if you, if you have a son who's not doing what's right, and you can help him, what do you want him to do? You want him to ask for help. You want him to come to you. You, you want him to, to come to, to you so you can help him because you care about him and you're his father. Well, that's the same thing that's going on right here with Jonah in, uh, Psalms, in Psalms 4, a Psalm of David. And verse 1 says, Answer me when I call, O God of my righteousness. You have relieved me in my distress. Be gracious to me and hear my prayer. And so uh, when, whenever we're in distress, we pray to God. And what's interesting is God heard him. God didn't say, well, you know, he ran off, so forget him. Um, I'm not going to deal with him anymore. I'm going to get rid of him, and, you know, this fish will just digest him. Uh, God, actually, God actually answered him, and he answered him, as he says here, from, from the depth of Sheol. But it required that uh, Jonah repent. It required that Jonah turns to God, that he comes to him, and that he uh, uh, changes his, his way of thinking. Um, Verse 3, he says, Where you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the sea, and the current engulfed me, all your breakers and billows passed over me. So in other words, as he's in the, the uh, uh, belly of the, the fish, the fish is going down into the deep, and of course he's being engulfed by everything, everything that's in there. Uh, in, in Psalms 88 and verse 5 through 8, it says, uh, Forsaken among the dead, like the slain who lie in the grave, whom you remember no more, 
and they are cut off from the hand, from your hand. You have put me in the lowest pit, in dark places, in the depths. Your, uh, your wrath has rested upon me, and you have afflicted me with all your waves. You have removed my acquaintances far from me. You have made me an object of loathing to them. I am shut up and cannot go out. One of the things that we need to remember <clears throat> is that as, as God is, is involved in this, one of the reasons that God is doing this is he's trying to get Jonah back. And so as a result of that, Jonah has to be disciplined. He has to be chastised, you might say. In Proverbs chapter 3, uh, and down here at verse 11, this is Proverbs 3 and verse 11, he says, My son, do not reject the discipline of the Lord or loathe his reproof. For whom the Lord loves, he, he reproves, even as a father corrects the son in whom he delights. So even as Jonah was being rebellious, God was trying to take care of him, and God was trying to provide for him, and, and, and God was trying to teach him a lesson. Uh, if you go over to Hebrews chapter 12, in Hebrews chapter 12, where it talks about uh, discipline, uh, and he's talking about uh, being faithful to God, he says in verse 4, this Hebrews 12, 4, he says, you have not yet resisted to the point of, of the shedding of blood in your striving against sin, he's talking about Christians. And you have forgotten the exhortation which is addressed to you as sons. <clears throat> My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor faint when you are reproved by him. In other words, as God's hand is on you, rather than saying, oh, it's, it's terrible, I'm, it's awful, I'll, I'm, you know, my life is over, uh, we're supposed to realize that God's trying to teach us something. God is trying to help us. Uh, he says, for whom, the, for whom the Lord loves, he disciplines. And he scourges every son whom he receives. So, so God wants to discipline uh, uh, Jonah uh, for the purpose of helping Jonah be right with God. Now, verse 7, he said, it is for discipline that you endure. Now, that's a rather weird statement. God is saying that we endure for discipline. What does that mean? What does it mean when he says we endure for discipline? Mumble, mumble, mumble. Okay, we learn. Okay, whatever dished out to, we ought to be able to take it. Right. That's right. God disciplines us for a reason, right? Uh, when you have kids, what do you have to do with them all the time? You have to teach them. You have to discipline them. That, that's the idea of discipline. It's not necessarily always that you're spanking them, but you're always correcting them. You're always disciplining them. You're always trying to, to help them. Well, well, why? Why are you doing that? Because they need to learn and they need to develop. Well, that's what God's doing with us. That's what this world is all about. That's why God leaves us here in this world, and that's why we have the problems in the world that we have, because God is going to discipline us. He's going to teach us stuff. It's, it's kind of like uh, you, you've heard of, of helic. Uh, uh, snowplow parents. You ever heard of snowplow parents? Those are terminology that are used that are used for the way parents uh, bring up their kids. Snowplow parents go in front of the in front of the parent in front of the kids, and they remove everything that might hurt the kid. They remove every obstacle. They don't want their kids suffering any consequences or anything at all. And so they go before them like a snowplow, moving the snow. And so, so they'll go and they'll, you know, they, they don't want their kids suffering at all. They don't want their kids going through anything. That's right. But that's how we learn. We learn through our suffering. We learn through our discipline. We learn through those, through those activities that we endure. So he says in verse 7 of, of Hebrews 12, uh, it is for discipline that you endure. God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If a father doesn't discipline his son, what's going to happen to the son? He's going to grow up rebellious. And that's what happens to a lot of the kids that are raised by, by helicopter parents or snowplow parents. They don't know how to deal with problems. They don't know how to deal with consequences. They don't know how to deal with those things. And so they, they act up and, and they get into trouble. Uh, instead of understanding how to take care of those things themselves, because mom and dad isn't going to be around all the time to go in front of them and take care of their problems. <clears throat> so he says in verse 8, but if you are without discipline, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. 
God says, if I'm not disciplining you in your life somewhere, then it's like you don't have a dad. It's like you don't have parents. But if I'm disciplining you, it's because uh, you're my sons. Verse 9. Furthermore, we had earthly fathers to discipline us, and we respected them. Shall we not much rather be subject to the Father's spirits and live? And he says, for they disciplined us for a short time as seemed best to them, but he disciplines us for our good so that we may share his holiness. All discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful, but sorrowful. Yet to those who have been trained by it, afterwards it yields the peaceable fruits of righteousness. And so he's, he's pointing out that that's the, way, that's the way discipline works. And that's what you have over here in the book of, of Jonah, when, when Jonah is in the uh, belly of the, of the fish and, and he is uh, suffering these things, he's, he's remembering or God is using them for the purpose of bringing him to recognition of who God is and of his role and what he needs to do. Uh, so uh, I believe that brings us over here to verse, um, where were we, four? Jonah 2, 4. He says, so I said, I have been expelled from your sight. Nevertheless, I will look uh, again towards your holy temple. So as, as um, Jonah is, is suffering these things and he's in the uh, belly of the fish and he's praying to God and asking God to, to uh, forgive him and to rescue him, uh, he, he points out that even though he's expelled, he's going to turn his attention towards the temple. Now, when he says he's going to turn his attention toward the temp temple, what it means is that uh, over here in, in, in uh, 1 Kings chapter 8, when, when um, uh, Solomon was building the temple and he's constructing the temple, he said, God, we know that you live in heaven. You don't live in this house. But he says in verse 38, he says, whatever prayer or supplication is made by any man or by, any of, uh, by, by all your people, Israel, each knowing the affliction of his own heart and spreading his hands towards this house, then here in heaven your dwelling place and forgive the act and render to each according to all his ways, whose heart you know, for you alone know the hearts of all the sons of Israel. So, um, uh, basically what, what uh, Solomon was saying was, Lord, we know you live in heaven, but you, you gave us this temple, and if we pray towards this temple, Lord, you here in heaven. And if, if a sincere person prays towards this temple, if, uh, because you know their hearts, if you know, if you know their hearts and they pray towards this temple, then you forgive them. And that's what, that's what Jonah meant when he says, I'm going to turn my attention towards the temple. In other words, he's going to seek God's favor. Now, uh, today, uh, who would that refer to or what would that refer to? Is that talking about we're supposed to pray today to the church? Since we say the church is the temple? We, we pray to Jesus. Okay, that's who we pray to. So that's why when we pray, we pray in the name of Jesus. Bill? That's right. He said, I will look again to his turn, which made his decision turning back. That's right. So, so you see Jonah's repentance here. He's, he's turned around, like Bill says. He's now going back. He's going to turn his attention to the temple and, and do whatever's necessary and whatever's required. And, and so that's what he's pointing out by the idea of him looking towards the, towards the holy temple. Now, remember, this is all going on in his head, uh, 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 in the um, belly of the, of the fish, while, while all this is happening. Now, verse 2, it says, or sorry, verse 5 says, Water encompassed me to the point of death. The great deep engulfed me. Weeds were wrapped around my head. Now, it's kind of strange, but for some reason, we sometimes don't change until we get way, 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 way over our head and in trouble. That's when we start changing. That's when we, when we, when we want, to, want to do what's right. Uh, in Psalms 40 and verse 2, he says, he brought me up out of the pit of destruction, out of the miry clay, and he set my foot upon a rock, making my footsteps firm. So really, when you, when you come to God, you come 
because you recognize that you have no other place to go to. You have no other person to go to, and you need to have your, your feet set on solid ground. You need to have your feet set on something firm in, instead of, you know, wandering around or, or uh, whatever it is that, that you're doing, following, following uh, uh, other paths. In this case, Jonah was following his own path, and as a result of following his own path, he, I think uh, Elijah's looking for his parents, and I think they're in the class back there. Okay, so uh, the, uh, uh, he's at the point of death, and that's what God has to do. Sometimes God has to bring us to that point to where uh, we're at our wit's end, and that's, that's what's going on here. Uh, Jonah was at, his, was at his wit's end. He's, he's at the place where he's throwing his hands up. Uh, that's the reason why sometimes it's not good to help people that are like on drugs, because the more you help them, the more they think they can handle their problem and they don't really repent, they don't really turn to God, they don't really come to God who can help them because other people are, are helping them from time to time. And don't misunderstand that. That doesn't mean that you're not, that, that we shouldn't help people. But I think we need to be careful about being enablers sometimes. And Jonah had to get down to the very depths of death. He had to say, I'm going to die if I don't change. You know, I, I need to do something. And that's what happens a lot of times to individuals before they come to God. They're, they're to the point of death and they have no other uh, recourse, and so they come to God. And that's what you see with Jonah there. Verse 6, he says, I descended to the roots of the mountains, and the earth with its bars was around me forever, but you have brought up my life from the pit, O oh my God. Now, uh, uh, we know that the Bible isn't a scientific book. We know that's not a scientific book. But that doesn't mean that what it says isn't scientifically correct. Whenever God says something, it's always correct. Uh, uh, sometimes the Bible has, or science has problems with the Bible because of bad science. And sometimes science has trouble with the Bible because of bad Bible. But God's word is always right. God's word is always true. Uh, one of the things, the reason I'm saying that is because he says in verse 6, I descend to the roots of the mountains. In other words, he's going down to the depths of the sea way down there where nobody's ever been. How did they know, how did he know what was down there? How did he know it wasn't flat? That's what they used to think. You know, it was, it's kind of like if you, if you have a pond and you throw water in it, it's kind of flat in there. It doesn't have a bunch of bumps, right? After a while, it just gets flat. <clears throat> but Jonah says there's mountains down here. There's mountains in the very bottom of the, of the ocean. Some of the, some of the tallest mountains in the world are in the bottom of the uh, uh, Marianic Trench, I believe is what it's called. There the, are mountains that are higher than Mount Everest down there. And so Jonah's writing the truth. He's writing what, what actually is down there. And so he says, I descended to the roots of the mountains. The earth with its bars was around me forever. But, uh, but you have, have brought up my life from the pit, O Lord my God. Now, the only person who can deliver us is God. He's the only person that can deliver us and, and give us life. Uh, in Psalms 104, there's a, there's a couple of uh, verses here. He says, you cover it with a deep uh, as with a garment. The waters were standing above the mountains, uh, again pointing out the idea of the mountains in the bottom of the ocean. Uh, in Psalms 104, verse 8, the mountains rose, the valleys sunk down to the place which you established. It's talking about God setting up the mount, the the oceans, and setting up the, the terrain of the oceans and exactly how he does that. And, and that. and that's what God's doing. But the point here is that God didn't abandon um, uh, Jonah to the sea. He didn't abandon Jonah to die. Uh, in Psalms uh, 16 and verse 10, he says, For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol, nor will you allow your Holy One to undergo decay. Well, God's not going to abandon us either. God, God is going to save us. Uh, just like we, just like Jonah, we have to recognize that that we have no recourse of life once this life is over, unless we turn to God, uh, and, and unless we turn to God, our life is gonna is gonna cease, or we're gonna come to an end uh, in in the uh, fiery grave. Uh, and so, uh, 
God is going to deliver us. Now, how does God deliver us? I'm sorry? I, I didn't hear. Okay. So, so, so how does God deliver us from our plight? Through Jesus. He delivers us through Jesus. Jesus. Jesus dies for our sins, and we accept the fact that he died for us. We accept the fact that he's the one that, that can uh, uh, give us that relationship with God. But we first have to, like Jonah, come to, the, come to our wits' end when it comes about our salvation and our relationship with him. So, so uh, uh, that's, what, that's really what this whole poem is about. It's about Jonah repenting, coming to the decision that he needs to serve God, needs to do what's right, and that he needs to quit following his own way. And God was gracious to him. Now, verse 7. He says, While I was fainting away, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came to you into your holy temple. So, see, he says he's fainting away. So, I kind of see him in that fish, and he's starting to, you know, to dive, whether from, whether from um, drowning or whether from being consumed, uh, he's, he's starting to, to die. He's, he's at the very end, and he turns to God, and so God delivers him, God saves him, uh, and allows him to, to live uh, inside that fish. Uh, he says, so I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came to you into your holy temple. Now, we understand that God's temple is actually in heaven. Uh, in, in Psalms 43 and verse 5, he says, uh, why are you in despair, O my soul, and why are you disturbed within me? Hope in God, for, uh, for I shall again praise him the help of my countenance and my God. So God, God is going to hear him and listen to him. And in, in 2 Chronicles 30 and verse 27, he says, Then the Levitical priests rose and blessed the people, and their voice was heard, and their prayers came to his holy dwelling place in heaven. And so, I mean, just, just think about that for a minute. The creator of the entire world who made everything and the, and the universe that, that we can't even reach the end of, when you speak to him in sincerity, when you cry to him in, in your need, he actually hears us. He actually hears us in heaven. That's where he hears us because he loves us and, and he's trying to save us. But we also need to learn certain lessons, which is the reason why we're here so that he can make us ready for heaven when that time comes. All right, any other questions so far? All right, verse, oh, yes. Just, just thinking about the knowledge that God hears from heaven when during the time of the Kings and Chronicles, didn't they still have the tabernacle? They did. God said he would dwell with them in mm -hmm. the tabernacle. Yep. But they still recognize that God hears them. That's exactly right. Yep. So God, so God dwells with us, but He hears in heaven. He, he's in heaven. Okay. In uh, in Jonah two verse eight, He says, "Those who regard vain idols forsake their faithfulness." In other words, Jonah is saying, "Oh yes." Yep. Yes. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah, uh, there actually is uh, records of individuals who are swallowed by whales, and they actually live a few hours. So, so it could right, but it, so it could be that that Jonah is actually in the whale and he's getting ready to to die. But when he, when he repents, God says, okay, I won't kill you. I'll, I'll bring you back to your state that you were at. Uh, and, and then we're going to see that Jonah's going to be vomited up. But uh, actually, if you look on the Internet and you, and you Google modern Jonah, yeah. some stories will come up. A couple of them, you know, are kind of eh. But there's actually a few in there that you can read that actually happened, and they're, they're pretty well documented. Now, the, the, the people that were swallowed... They didn't stay in there for, you know, days. Uh, but nonetheless, what I'm pointing out is that Jonah might have been swallowed by this fish. He, he might have been in there a couple of hours 
before he maybe died, and he's sitting there praying to God. And so rather than God saying, okay, you know, uh, I was going to do away with you, but since you repented, I'll go ahead and restore you. Yeah. All right. So uh, verse 8, he says, those who regard vain idols forsake their faithfulness. In other words, J Jonah's saying, when, when I wasn't doing what was right, I was seeking somebody else's advice or listening to something else instead of you. And so if you're, if you're following something else instead of following God, then you have vain idols. It doesn't matter if it's a, a, a statue or if it's just a principle that you're following that God doesn't teach. Uh, in Jeremiah chapter 2 and 13, he says, For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living water, to hew for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. And so as Jeremiah was writing, remember Jeremiah's writing when, when uh, Judah is, is going off into Babylonian captivity, and he says the reason they're going off into ba uh, Babylonian captivity is because they've done two things. One, they've forsaken God, who is the fountain of living water. He, he's, like a, he's like a spring, and they have gone to idols, which are like cisterns. Now, what's the difference between a cistern and a, and a, a spring? A spring is fresh and renew and renews its water. A cistern is a tank that holds water, and if, if, they're, if it's exposed to outside, you have bugs in it, you have germs in it, you have all this stuff that's sometimes dead animals are in it. Uh, and so, which of the two do you want to drink out of? You want to drink out of a spring, or do you want to drink out of this, right? And the reason that a cistern uh, he mentions a cistern is because a cistern doesn't have life in it. Okay. The, the spring has life in it, you, you, uh, you can say. And, and so if you're, not following, if you're not following the principles of the Bible, then whatever you're following is going to end up in, in death. You'll eventually get sick and die from it, uh, whatever it is. And that's why in Jeremiah 10 and verse 8 he says, But they are altogether stupid and foolish in their discipline of delusion. Their idols is wood. And so it doesn't matter whether your idol is wood or whether your idol is some principle that you're holding that you think is going to uh, uh, allow God to overlook your sins. Uh, either way, if you, if you serve idols, then you're going to forsake uh, the, your faithfulness to God. Verse 9, he says, But I will sacrifice to, to you with the voice of thanksgiving. That which I have vowed I will pay. Salvation is from the Lord. And so when he says this, I believe what he's talking about is, is God, you had asked me to do a task, so I'll do it. I'll do what you, what you tell me to do. Uh, and that's the way it's supposed to be. God is our God, so therefore, we do whatever he says. Uh, in Psalm 66 and verse 13, uh, the writer says, I shall come into your house with burnt offerings. I shall pay you my vows, which my lips uttered, and my mouth spoke when I was in distress. I shall offer to you burnt offerings of fat beasts when the smoke, uh, when the smoke of, uh, with the smoke of rams, I shall make an offering of bulls uh, with male goats. And so he's pointing out the different sacrifices that he's going to make. I don't know if you ever remember a story called The End. Uh, it, it was a movie. And it was Dom DeLuise and um, uh, Burt Reynolds. And Burt Reynolds uh, had got some information that he was going to die of cancer. And he didn't want to die of cancer. So he, so he hired uh, Dom DeLuise to kind of to kill him, but he didn't want to know when. Okay, and so Dom DeLuise was kind of a little half-wit, you know, in the movie, and so all the attempts to try to kill uh, Burt Reynolds failed, and so finally Burt Reynolds decides, well, I'm just going to go kill myself, and so he goes to the ocean, he starts swimming out to the ocean, and he starts swimming out there, and all of a sudden he kind of starts going under, he starts going under, and all of a sudden he comes and goes, I want to live, I want to live, and so as he starts swimming back, he says, Lord, if you get me back, I promise I'll give you, I'll give you 10%, Lord. You know, I promise I'll do that. And as he gets closer, he says, Lord, I'm, you know, I, I will give you that 5%. And as he gets on land, he says, Lord, I'll, I'll go see you every so often. That's the way some people are. What this, is, what this is telling us is that we're supposed to pay our vow. Whatever our vow is, we're to do it. So if we say that Jesus is our Lord and Master, then we need to act like he's our Lord and Master. We don't just say it to get out of trouble, and then once we're out of trouble, we go, oh, really didn't mean it, Lord. Okay? 
we're supposed to do, we're supposed to keep our vows. And that's, that's what Jonah is saying in verse 9. He says, but I will sacrifice to you with, with the voice of thanksgiving. That which I have vowed, I will pay. Salvation is from the Lord. And so that was Jonah's prayer. That was his attitude. And so God uh, reacts. In verse 10, it says, then the Lord commanded the fish and it vomited Jonah up on the dry land. And so Jonah gets thrown up on the dry land. Uh, I would suggest, although the Bible doesn't tell us, I would suggest that there was probably fishermen around that, that, that saw this when this whale comes up and just kind of upchucks Jonah. And, and, and they, probably, they probably saw that. And the reason I'm telling you that is because more than likely, that's why he had such success in Nineveh. Because when he got, when he got to Nineveh, people had heard the story. They had probably heard the story about him uh, being uh, cast into the ocean, and this whale comes by, and they're all thinking, well, he's dead. You know, God, God uh, punished his servant, and now he's dead. And then they probably hear the story about Jonah being thrown up, you know, a, a person being thrown up by a whale on the, on the beach. And so now they hear about that. And so when Jonah goes to preach to them, they, they have some background, I believe, they have some background of what Jonah uh, uh, experienced. And so therefore, when he starts preaching to them, they're, they're going to respond favorably to him, just like, just like Jesus. Once we know that Jesus uh, died and was buried and was raised from the dead, we respond to him. Now, I don't think there's any other religious leader that has ever done that. And so that's why we don't respond to them. Gandhi never did that. Buddha never came back from the dead. Uh, uh, Joseph Smith never came back from the dead. The popes never came back from the dead. So we don't, we don't listen to them. We listen to Jesus because of the experience that he went through that we heard about, and therefore we accept Jesus because he's the only one that we know of who died and was raised from the dead uh, and, and, and was witnessed with accuracy and with truthfulness. And so therefore we accept him. And I suggest to you that that's probably what you have going on here when, Joan, when this uh, whale... Uh, you know, vomits up Jonah uh, on whatever beach he was. It's, I'm, you know, I'm kind of assuming, but I believe there was like fishermen and, and other people there that would have seen it and, and, and you know, been able to tell other people. Uh, all right, so any questions or thoughts on chapter two? All right, next week we'll start in chapter three. So uh, let's have ourselves a prayer. Lord God and Father in heaven, we thank you for the events that Jonah went through because sometimes, Father, we fail to accomplish and finish the task that you have given us to do. And we pray that we, like Jonah, might come to our senses and might turn to you and call upon you because you are the only one, Father, who can give us eternal life. You're the only one who can save us and bless us. So we pray that you help us not to rely on idols or, or uh, ideas or principles that you don't teach, but that we trust in you and that we drink from your fountain of life. And we just praise you and thank you for all things. And we thank you for Jesus and your Holy Spirit. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.